Well, from those humble beginnings, you are now a billionaire. How has money changed your life or maybe the landscape of experience in your life? Does it buy happiness? It doesn't buy happiness, but it buys you a level of comfort for you to really amplify what happiness is. I, I kind of think about it in the following way. Let's just say that there's a, a hundred things on a table and the table says, find happiness here. And there are different prices. The way that the world works is that many of these experiences are cordoned off a little bit behind a velvet rope where you think that there's more happiness as the prices of things escalate, right? If you live in an apartment, you admire the person with the house. If you live in a house, you admire the person with the bigger house. That person admires the person with, you know, um, an island, mm -hmm. right? Um, some person drives their car, admires the person who flies, who admires the person who flies business class, who admires the person who flies first, you know, to private. There's all of these escalations on this table. And most people get to the first five or six. And so they just naturally assume that items, you know, seven through a hundred is really where happiness is found. And the, just to, you know, tell you the, the finish line, I've tried a hundred and back and <laughs> I've tried two, two more hundred to it. Uh, and happiness isn't there. Um, but it does give you a level of comfort. I read a study, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it said that, um, the absolute sort of like maximal link between money and happiness is around $50 million. And there was a, it was just like a social studies kind of thing that I think one of the Ivy Leagues put out. And underneath it, the way that they explained it was because you could have a home, you could have all kinds of the creature comforts, you could take care of your family. Um, and then you were left to ponder what it is that you really want. I think the challenge for most people is to realize that this escalating arms race of, you know, more things will solve your problems is not true. Um, more and better is not the solution. It's, it's this idea that you are on a very precise journey that's unique to yourself. You are playing a game of which only you are the player. Everybody else is an interloper and you have a responsibility to design the gameplay. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. Because if they did, I think they would make a lot of different decisions about how they live their life. And I still do the same thing. I mean revert to basically running around asking other people, what will make you like me more? You know, what will make me more popular in your eyes? And I try to do it. And it never works. Um, it is just a complete dead end. Is there negative aspects to money? Like, for example, it becoming harder to find people you can trust? I think the most negative aspect is that it amplifies a 360 degree view of your personality because there are a lot of people and society tells you that more money is actually better. You are a better person somehow and you're factually more worthwhile than some other people that have less money. That's also a lie. But when you're given that kind of attention, it's very easy for you to become a caricature of yourself. Um, that's probably the single worst thing that happens to you. But I say it in the opposite way. I think all I've ever seen in Silicon Valley, as an example, um, is that when somebody gets a hold of a lot of money, it tends to cause them to become exactly who they were meant to be. They're either a kind person. They're either a, a curious person. They're either a jerk. You know, they're either cheap. And they can use all kinds of masks. But now that there's no expectations and society gives you a get out of jail free you start to behave the way that's most comfortable to you. So you see somebody's innate personality. And that's a really interesting thing to observe because then you can very quickly bucket sort where do you want to spend time and who is really, you know, additive to your gameplay and who is really a negative detractor to your gameplay. You're an investor, but you're also a kind of philosopher. Um, you analyze the world in all its different uh, perspectives on All In Podcasts, on Twitter, everywhere. Uh, do you worry that money makes puts you out of touch from being able to truly empathize with the experience of the general population, which in part, first of all, on a human level, that could be limiting, but also as an analyst of human civilization, that could be limiting. 
I think it definitely can for a lot of people because it's just a it's an abstraction for you to stop caring. Right. Um, I also think the other thing is that you can very quickly, um, especially in today's world, become the scapegoat. Just to use a Girardian, like Rene Girard, if you look, if you think about like mimetic theory in a nutshell, you know, we're all competing for these very scarce resources that we are told is worthwhile. And if you view the world through that Girardian lens, what are we really doing? We are all fighting for scarce resources, whether that's Twitter followers, money, acclaim, notoriety, and we all compete with each other. And in that competition, you know, Gerard writes like the only way you escape that loop is by scapegoating something or somebody. And I think we are in that loop right now where just the fact of being successful is a thing that one should scapegoat to end all of this, you know, tension that we have in the world. I, I think that it's a little misguided because I don't think it solves the fundamental problem. Um, and we can talk about what the solution to some of these problems are, but um, that's, I think, the loop that we're all living. And so if you become a caricature, caricature and you feed yourself into it, I mean, you're not doing anything to, to really advance things.